Hey everybody, it's Jason. Welcome or welcome back to the Mosaic Church Podcast. At the end of this podcast, please take a moment to connect with us on social media. It's a great place to learn more and to see what's happening at Mosaic. Most importantly, hope the following message encourages and inspires you to take a new step on your faith journey. Enjoy. Well, the past few weeks, we've been in this series called Following the Way. If you're just joining us for the first time, either here in person or on our YouTube channel, it's been quite an exploration as we've been finding something kind of catastrophic about our faith journey is that do we really know how to follow Jesus? Like, do we really know much about him? It's so simple, but so unbelievably complex because this is what we found that we have found that we as humans have messed this thing up so bad because we want to follow Jesus, but we started making things up along the way, and then we don't really know him and his priorities, and we don't know his characteristics, and so now we start having a, quote, Christian faith that looks different across the globe, even though we're following one movement by one person named Jesus Christ. And so this has caused so much confusion, and what we learned is that we don't really know what he did or what he said, and the past few weeks I've been challenging us to read the red letters. Now, if you're new to Bible reading, uh, the red letters inside of our scriptures, those are typically, if you have that Bible, it means that you got the level up Bible because they made it red, and so the red letters are the words of Jesus uh, in your Bible, if you have that, or in your Bible apps, and I said, let's just do this. Let's start a journey of just listening to him, reading what he said, where did he go, who did he hang out with, and I went on this journey years ago, and it completely changed my life. It really did. As a pastor, I've been doing this 22 years of full-time ministry, and this journey happened to me, I'd say, about eight years ago, and I started to read the red letters, and this is something that I found as I read that was shocking to me, is is that the the Jesus that I was taught in the American church is not the Jesus that I'm reading in the Bible. He hung out with people that you guys would fire me for if I did. He did things and said things so countercultural to the movement because he was bringing the kingdom of God or God's way of living to us, and he made it clear. And he says, I'm not here to blow up everything from the past in the Old Testament. I'm here to complete it, fulfill it, and teach you what it's supposed to mean. And so in the reading of the red letters, I was reading and journaling, and I was starting to be blown away by the fact that all this time, I really didn't know Jesus. I had ideas, glimpses, kind of more like a slideshow. Now, slideshow, for all of us older people, we remember slides in class. And if you're the good kid, you got to click the thing in class people not laughing. You're the naughty kids. You're always salty because you didn't get to click the thing in class. And so uh, for those who don't know our younger uh, Gen Z and, uh, and some of our alphas, we'd have this slide thing, and a slide was a still picture, and you'd click it, click, click, and then the new picture would be projected on the screen. And so you'd have a picture, but then there was this little soundtrack that went along with it. Remember the soundtrack? Beep! And then you got to click. And if you clicked too early, the teacher would give you a bad look. You clicked too late. I mean, you had to be on the beat, and that's why the most responsible kids like me, of course, got to do the slides. Uh, no, I didn't get to. But So this slideshow, and what a slideshow does compared to what we have now is it just gives you a picture, but it doesn't tell the whole story. We're just seeing like a glimpse of something, whether we're learning about the pyramids, or we're learning about the Great Wall of China, whatever we're learning in school, we see a picture, but we don't really see its entirety. We see a portion of it. We don't smell the air. We don't get to touch. We don't get to have our senses engaged. We're just kind of seeing a little glimpse of it. And what we have done over the course of time is that humans, we're so good at this, have taken glimpses and pictures of Jesus and made a slideshow And this is where it gets weird. This is what we've been learning. We have made a slideshow of Jesus in our own lives of the parts that we like. Like, I like that Jesus loves me, click. I don't like that he tells me to forgive my neighbor, out. I like the part of Jesus where he loves unconditionally and saves me, 
in, click. I don't like the part of Jesus that he calls me to live a life of holiness. Ooh, gone. And so what we have done is we've created a Jesus that's incomplete. It's not a complete story of truthfully Jesus, and that has become modern Christianity. In year 2024, people are walking away from the church in droves, and as I'm studying and learning and trying to understand why this is happening, this is what I am finding. People are not walking away from Jesus. They're walking away from American Christianity. Let me say this again. They're not walking away from Jesus. They're walking away from American Christianity. What is American Christianity? It is a mix of the great dream of entrepreneurship, of bigger, better, faster, build it and they will come. They've got this big, huge idea. We create CEOs and corporations, and they're like, wait a minute, I read Jesus, and that dude was homeless, and he walked around, and he gave to the poor, and he walked with people that our modern pastors don't even talk to, like nothing is making sense. And so people are not walking away from the true Jesus. They're walking away from what we've created him to be. Now, for those who've been around Mosaic for a while, we are doing the best we can to take a stand against that and say, if Jesus did it, we did it. If Jesus said it, we said it. We're fighting against a culture of American Christianity, and that is hard. I'm going to tell you why it's hard for me, because it's truth time. I had a lot of coffee. I'm spicy. Get ready for a 55-minute sermon. (laughs) This is hard. Because if I don't meet the marks that's seen as success as a pastor, I'm seen as not successful. Let me tell you what that means. You work in your job, and depending on what you do for a living, no matter what you do, you are successful and you get those high marks when you exceed expectations. And the expectations are laid out for you. If you're welding, hey, we want this many done. If you're sales, we need these numbers, these marks. Whatever your marks are in your job, you have marks and things that you're trying to reach to make yourself Uh, grow up the corporate ladder. And I remember when I was a beginning youth pastor, someone asked me, and I I was in youth ministry, and I was called to ministry. I didn't seek this this, uh, position out. God called me, without a doubt, to be a junior high youth pastor in the year 2002. And from there, uh, we're here today. I remember someone asked me, I was about five to eight years into my ministry, and someone said, hey, Jason, when are you going to be a real pastor? And I said, oh, <laughs> what do you mean by that? I remember that sinking feeling. Like, when, when are you going to, like, climb the ladder? Like, you go from here to junior high to senior high, senior high to family life, family life to executive, executive assistant, da 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 And then when you're really great, you get to be a lead pastor. And I said, I don't know when God asks me to. And they kind of scoffed and like, oh. I remember when I would preach because I was just, the, just the high school pastor, it wasn't seen as authoritative because I wasn't that guy. That is not scripture. We made that up. In fact, in the Bible, what we see a calling to is that there's supposed to be elders of the church who are pastoring and caring for the spiritual health of our churches. That there's supposed to be people that care for people, and these people now care for their community, and we care and love, and that's what we see in Acts chapter 2 called the way. People started gathering, and they started coming together, and known as the way from Jesus' teaching, saying, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. The way starts exploding because the people are out preaching and bringing people to Jesus Christ, telling them that they've seen the resurrection at the same time, calling them to a life of dropping everything and following them. And so they started gathering together to worship God and to hear the teachings of Jesus. But then Christianity became popular. That's over 2,000 years ago. And now Christianity becomes popular. And if you know anything about human history, Christianity has been used so darkly to do terrible, terrible things. The Crusades. Every Christian school, that's the Crusaders. You've got to rethink that. Because Crusades was a massacre. The Spanish Inquisition the Atlantic slave trade, segregation, racism, sexism. We have used religion as a place of power to get sex and money. And this was started by Jesus, who was a, bringing a movement of love and forgiveness. And so we have disconnected majorly, friends, with who Jesus really is, who he asked us to be, 
and what he's actually asked us to do. I mean, isn't that crazy? Think about this. A movement of love has now turned into a movement of hate. Ask anybody who does not believe in faith, does not believe in Christ, does not believe in God, tell me, what do you think about Christianity? And they are going to tell you, most likely, the negatives that they see. I have not heard anybody who's not a follower of Christ say, oh, you're a movement of love to transform our community and the world. We love you guys. It is, you guys are bigots. You guys are misogynistic. You guys are racist. You guys are angry. Fill in the blanks over and over again. What happened? This is what's happened. We have lost an understanding of who Jesus is. And so in this series, we've been exploring, and we're going back into this again, to know the Jesus and to follow the way, you have to know the way. And the way that you know the way is that book, which is in your phone now, explains who he is. And some of us in the year 2024, because technology has become so simple, I want to speak against our, our quick fix, give me a TikTok about Jesus way of thinking, right? One of the things that's changed in generations for us, I'm uh, those who've been around, I'm Gen X, I'm so proud, right? So things have changed from motion pictures into YouTube videos, from YouTube videos into now TikTok reels. The attention span is approximately 15 to 30 seconds long, which means you're already tuned out. 15 to 30, just get, get to the point, get to the point, get to the point, get to the point. What's next? Scroll, scroll, scroll. And our minds are changing, and we're looking at Jesus from a concept of, I want the next pastor to give me that next quick fix, tell me something good about it, and I move on to the next thing. Instead of slowing down, being a student of the Word, and reading the Word of God for yourself. In 2025, I'll be bringing a plan for us to be reading the Bible. It's not going to be, read a Bible in a year, because that gives me anxiety, because I miss a day, and I'm like, I'm 55 chapters behind. But instead, we're going to be engaging in 2025, wherever you are on your journey, to touch the pages yourself. Read for yourself. Set goals for yourself for a year of just engaging to know who is this God really. And as we start to read and explore, we're going to be fascinated by wonderful things, and you are going to be scared of some things. And you're not going to like some things, and you're going to love some things. But this isn't about us liking or not liking, accepting or not accepting. This is who God is, and we know him from the word of God. Pastors, teachers, everyone can say whatever they want. We are going to be students of the word ourselves, because you have to learn to feed yourself and to know yourself, because Mosaic is a movement of disciple-making discipleship. And the top thing I hear in this story of like, I don't know how to disciple. It's because you don't know him and you don't know what he said. Let's learn what he said, know what he did, and just talk about the Bible. It's super easy when we make it that simple. TikTok versions of Jesus are not bad things. Like, we can get a quick, a quick word, but, but what if you became an actual, I want to know who he is? And that's what we are going to be doing in this series. So today we're in John 1. One to five, those who have their Bibles and Bible apps, we turn the lights on for you here uh, if you want to open up those things. You'll learn quickly if you have your Bible, sit in the back. If you don't, sit in the front. So, <laughs> John 1, 1. If you are a student of the Word or have been reading for a while, this is a very familiar passage to you. Uh, you've heard it before. If you're newer to Bible reading or to Scriptures, this is going to sound very confusing. And regardless of where you are in your journey, we're breaking this down into the simplicity of this because we're going to learn more about who Jesus is today. Who is he really? What did he say? What did he do? And who is this one that we worship? John 1, 1 to 5, it says this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. First thing we're going to hear is here, it's, it's confusing. There's a lot of words. He's going all over the place. Remember, this isn't the year 2024 in America. This is an ancient passage moved into our language. And so th some things don't work as well, and there's a different way, uh, like the words don't translate as well for us. We don't really understand it as clearly in the original language, and some pieces of it, remember, this is an ancient text. This isn't like picking up a novel from Barnes & Noble. So the best thing to do in these type of things is to slow down. 
slow down our Bible reading, slow it down, and let's take a look at what he is saying. So that's what we're going to do today. Very first thing he says, in the beginning was the Word. Now, for us who have been in Scripture for a while, we understand the Word is translating to Jesus. But if this is new to you, the capital W is translating the Word of God, which is what Jesus is known for, into uh, into a language saying that Jesus is the Word. And so he says, in the beginning was Jesus, the Word, the action, the movement of God. And this was done very intentionally by John for our Jewish readers, because now we go into Genesis 1.1. It says, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. Look at this. He wasn't a bystander. He was there. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. So John takes this reference here of logos, the word of God, the movement of God, and says now he's referencing back to Genesis chapter 1-1, in the beginning, and he says, in the beginning. So this would be like, oh yeah, I know where he's going with this. So in the beginning, in the beginning, God spoke and it came. The word of God created. So for people who are reading this, there's a different thought about who, who is this Jesus? He was just a man. He wasn't really God. He was just a good prophet. He was a nice guy who did nice things. He got murdered because he was outside the realm of what Rome wanted for, and they thought he was going to take over Rome. They're going to have all these ideas, and John says, no, 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 no. You don't know who he is. Jesus is at the beginning, and he was creating. He said, let there be light, and there's light. And this would be common. This logos would be a common thought for both Jewish and for all of our Gentile Greek readers, because the word for Jesus, it's pointing back to the Old Testament. For the Greeks, the logos is a bridge. They use that word to bridge a transcendent God with material universe. So a Greek reader, remember, Greek minds are different than Jewish minds are different than American minds. The Greek reader is saying, okay, logos means that there's this thing out here, and there's this stuff down here, and there's a bridge. And so to a Jewish reader, they're like, oh yeah, Genesis 1. To the Greek reader, like, okay, there's some bridge between God and man. And so now John is making this statement to say, listen, it isn't who you think that he is or want him to be. In the beginning, this Jesus, he was there in the beginning, everything. Now, what we're going to hear here is we keep going through this passage is John's going to show us something about Jesus that maybe you don't haven't thought about. Because of his status and who he was and where he was and what happened through him, he has 100% authority over everything, everybody, including you. And as humans, I don't like that. We like to pretend and think that we have control over our lives. I want to control the fact that when I go to Piggly Wiggly, my ham is hot. The rolls are on the rack. I pick up my package. I go home. And then I go to Piggly Wiggly late, and there's no ham. And I'm out of control, and I'm sassy. I want hot ham. Then I get regular shaved ham. I try it. It doesn't taste as good. I want control of my life. I want tomorrow to come the way I want it. I want tomorrow to be exactly the way. I'm going to wake up, and I'm going to do these five things. I want control of my life. I want control of my health. I want control of my finances. I want control of my family. I want control of my kids. I want control of my... Are you getting where I'm going with this? Jesus is the authority in control of everything, including you. Since he is the beginning, he is the creator, Jesus is the one who is the one everything stems through. He's the beginning of us. We're going to keep reading in our passage. Moving on. And the word was with God. Jesus is with God. And the word Jesus was God. He was with God in the beginning. Jesus is this living message. He is the living, the definition of God the Father, that when Jesus comes, he did not become a God. He wasn't some separate identity that God said, I'm going to create Jesus. The Father did not say, I'm going to make a Savior. Jesus was God, is God, was with God in the beginning. And so now as Jesus comes, 
He didn't rise to some level of God. Jesus was literally God. He always has been. Or understand this, why? Because again, we're going to find out in history here in a few seconds that humans keep trying to change who Jesus was. Jesus was literally God. He wasn't created. He wasn't a separate being. He was and is God. The difference between the God of the Father that is unseen to the one that is seen is that Jesus lowered himself to the form of us. So a body of flesh and a spirit of God melds together, 100% human, 100% God, all God. And he came not as a created being, but the spirit of Christ is the really, literally God. He is God. Now, why is this so important? In our world, in our day and age, we have a lot of different views, but there's a big movement that was happening back then. Docetism believed in this belief that Jesus could not have a natural body. There's no way God could have a natural body. And his life on earth was like this phantom. And so there's this movement that came out of Jesus's, uh, after Jesus had left, that there was a belief that if Jesus was really God, sure, he was God, but his body wasn't. It was fake. It was this phantom or apparition. So he did not suffer because God would not suffer. He would not have been crucified because God can't be crucified. And it means, therefore, he did not have salvation through his death and resurrection for us because he didn't have a real body. Now, if that sounds kind of weird to you, a lot of people believe that. We can become comfortable with understanding the fact, well, Jesus was God, we understand that. But even the fact that Jesus is 100% God and 100% man, you're probably like, man, this is kind of making my head scratch a little bit. This is complicated, right? It's not who we want Jesus to be. It's who he is. So when John is setting this up, he is showing us the clarity. John walked and talked with Jesus. The word was with God. The word was God. And God is in the beginning. So in the beginning, Jesus is there. He literally is God. He is the actual word of God. And he literally was both man and God at the same time. Then this movement of Gnosticism rose up. You'll see some writings about this and some teaching about false teachers in the New Testament. And it rose, and that said this, that matter, human matter, matter is in itself evil. So anything of flesh and bone, we are just, this is all evil. What is good is only spirit. And the only way that you receive salvation is through enlightened learning, a special revelation. If I can understand God, therefore I have divine knowledge, I am saved by this special way of being, quote unquote, smarter than all of you. And this Gnosticism started to arise that if I can save myself, because if Jesus could not in no way be evil, because our body is evil, they would deny themselves any pleasures of flesh, any pleasures, any joy, because this is all evil. We have to just be in spirit, and we have to understand spiritually. That sounds like a miserable religion to me, because I really, really like treats. <laughs> I like the small things. I enjoy, and I see that God is the creator in the beginning. And if God's the creator in the beginning, he says it is good, and Jesus is the one that created it and said that it was good, I should therefore say this is rad. Like, this is good. God has created nature. It is good. God has created largemouth bass. Those are definitely good. God has created 12-point bucks. I don't shoot them because I can't ever see them. I get spikes all the time. And so, like, all of this is just growing in this thinking and this idea that, that we have to try to make Jesus into a box that feels good to them and to us. In our current day, we have a form of Gnosticism where we don't say that evil is all, matter is bad, but we say knowledge is spirituality. Process this for a second in our American church. The guy who sits in your Bible study and can quote everything, you think he is really, really religious. And the guy who's like, I read my Bible 17 times a day, and they can, like, they start talking, like, they don't even say words anymore. Like, they just, like, well, yeah, according to the word, like, they just have, like, like Bible whiz, right? They have all this knowledge. Or perhaps the guy on the stage. The guy on the stage who went to seminary learns all this stuff. Like, well, his spiritual life has to be so superior because we believe in America that knowledge 
and understanding is the key to spirituality. You see the fear here a little bit where we're moving towards? That's not what, that's not what Jesus said. We're supposed to know, and my spiritual life, my understanding transforms me. And I'm supposed to live and talk and be like Jesus. I'm supposed to use this knowledge to change the world. I'm supposed to use this knowledge to disciple others. I'm supposed to use what I understand to transform me, to transform others. But we worship in America knowledge. And we're getting really scary close to Gnosticism. Because then you say, well, pastor, I don't know enough about God. I can't talk about God. And tell me where in the Bible it says that. You just believe that because of the culture that we've built. So you see how we're building a Jesus and a faith that he didn't say. We're making this thing up. Because Jesus is writing to his readers. He is the beginning of creation. He was God. He is God. And he is God who took human form. He came to teach us the kingdom of God, show us what we're supposed to be doing, and now we are saved when we call on his name, and now we go and tell the story. That's what Jesus said. All the other stuff, and how much stuff do you think you believe that you made up? Just let's pause for a second. How much stuff about Christianity do you believe that is made up? Maybe you grew up. You grew up. I cannot believe that the priest on the stage is wearing jeans, right? This is just bugging you that I don't have robes on. And you're like, dude, like, where are the robes? Maybe you grew up saying, hey, you know, how come we don't dance and jump and bounce around in here? I'm like, because we're all German and nobody does that, you know, German. Like, like, you may have these beliefs or these thoughts, and you've been building on a tradition or a preference instead of what God actually said to do. And friends, this is hard. You can't follow the way unless you know the way. Because I'm going to replicate and teach people what I know, and I think that I know. So if I believe that the purpose of my, the pastor's job is I'm going to bring my friend to church so my pastor tells them all about Jesus. How many times I've heard this? I had a dollar, man. Every time I heard this, I'd probably have $15. But this is true. <laughs> and I've heard this so many times. Pastor, I hope you have a good sermon today. I brought my lost friend. You better present the gospel. Like, oh, I'll rewrite my sermon. You know, like, is it my job? Your job is to bring your friend to church. Is that your job? Or is your job to disciple, according to Matthew 28, that says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything I have taught you. It is your job. My job is to train you to go do your job according to the Bible, according to the role of leaders in the church, to train, equip, to send. But you have this false belief. We've started to believe this story because we're not reading the Word. The Word, the Bible, is Jesus showing us how to do our lives together and with Him. Super simple but we get our traditions caught into it. One of the traditions I personally love as we move into our Thanksgiving season is everything Thanksgiving. I love it. I, I am a, such a fan of turkey and stuffing, and we're not going to argue about this as facts. Uh, sweet potatoes with marshmallows, the greatest thing God has ever created for Thanksgiving time. I didn't have that as a kid. I was introduced to that later in life. I'm like, what is this mix of deliciousness? There's nothing healthy as it's sitting in four inches of butter. <laughs> and I'm num, 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 num. Tryptophan is a real thing. Y'all fall asleep, man. I mean, it's that, or maybe I ate 5,000 calories of carbs. But I love Thanksgiving. And when I have Thanksgiving, I know what I love on Thanksgiving. I have my traditions of what I want on the table. It gives me comfort. I like it. It brings me back to an older time where I felt safe. As a kid, it makes me feel comfortable with family. And some of you have a tradition afterwards that you sit and watch football all day. Maybe you have a tradition afterwards to go do a turkey bowl, play football with some friends. Maybe you have a tradition where you just pass out for eight hours. Then you wake up and eat pumpkin pie. Delicious pumpkin pie. I love it. All these things are part of what's ingrained in us and wired us because of our experiences. But our faith in Jesus Christ cannot be built on experiences or traditions 
has to be based on us understanding who he is, what he said, and what matters to him. So our traditions and the real Jesus have come into a clash, and now we've got a little bit of a mess. So let's keep going into our passage to learn more about who he is. This is Jesus. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. John establishes, here is Jesus, the creator. He is the creator. He is clearly the one who was in the beginning with God. God speaks. Jesus is making everything. Pluto, planet or not a planet? I don't know. Traditions change. Jesus made it. That star, when you're sitting outside late at night when you're up north, and it's just that beautiful sky, this is one of my favorite things to do. So I lean back and I look at the big pines, and the big pines I can see the stars. I'm like, my master made every speck. When you get to see that kind of purplish haze when the sun is dropping with the orange and purple over, like, you see, I'm already thinking about spring, sorry, guys, but the <laughs> orange and purple, and that color of the sky that cannot be created by my hand, my master made that because he wanted to. He didn't have to make the sky that color. And I didn't have to make me, so I love that color. Like, I sit here in awe of him because everything is created. This isn't some mindless matter explosion of I hope it goes well for us. This was an intelligent creator creating an intelligent design for the purpose of his glory. So since he has created all things, everything is his, that means you were created and you are his. Absolutely everything. So if he's the creator, that does, it means he can't be created, and God is eternal. So Jesus always has, it been, always has been, where we come into the story is that there's a moment in human time where Jesus says, I'm going to appear now like this. That isn't the beginning of Jesus. He always has been, always will be. He just entered our time frame at that time when he took human form. And so if you're like, well, I hear you, pastor, but... You know, I really like the idea that sometime, like, there were, like, you know, some sort of orbs that kind of blew into each other, and the poof, here we are, and, and there was this cosmos that was in chaos, and, and it just so much happened. Look, I'm not here to argue science with you. This is what I'm here to say with you. God created, and how he did it, he did however he wanted to, because he's the creator. Did it take seven literal days or take 10,000 years? God can do whatever he wants. He's God. God can poof in, he can poof out. He can take time, he can go fast, he can go slow. And what is fast and slow? He doesn't live in our time frame. So now we get even more complicated. But know who he is. Because when you know who he is, the topics and arguments that we're having fall on the wayside to worship that my Jesus is the creator. And that's who he is. We can talk and debate about other things, but the truth is he's my creator. He was in the beginning he was through all things. Everything that happened was because of him and through him. And now because of him and through him, I'm here, which means if he created me, I have a purpose in his story. When humans lose their purpose, they lose and forget the fact that Jesus created you. You were created on purpose. There's not chaos. It's all purposeful. You were created on purpose. I don't know if you've ever heard that before. But as Jesus says, creator, if you're created on purpose, he saved you on purpose. We see Jesus like, oh, he saved the whole world and he, he died for us. We hear these big statements, but let's just slow it down for a second to the creator God who made something, it went sideways because of us, and then he went and saved his creation. Think of that. Just own that for a second, friends, because value sits so rich and if there's anything I'm giving thanks for more than anything right now is this journey that I'm on of understanding what that means. You're created on purpose. He saved you on purpose. And if he has not saved you yet and you're still exploring Christianity, he is calling you to be saved because he loves you. The creator loves his creation. He made it all and said, this is good. It's good. Verse 4. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. As Jesus' creator, Jesus gives life. 
So the life, the Word, is giving us life, and through the Creator, all things come through Him. He gives to us physically. We need food. We need shelter. We need clothes. We need air. We need things. But it's not just physical. He also is the spiritual. God gives to us eternal life. He is the giver of life, the sustainer of life. He is the one that is the life given to all of mankind. So to a Jewish reader, Yahweh was their God, and now this is for all people. Jesus Christ came to save all of humanity. Israel was the pathway to bring the Messiah, and the Messiah came for absolutely everybody. And this light, the light that he's brought us into, darkness is always seen as sin, as our view of our world. If we say something about our world and our culture and our life, if we look around the world, all the wars, all the death, all the famines, all the murder, every day I get up, I try to turn on the news to just find out what's happening. And if I tune on one more time and see Milwaukee had 10 shootings one more time, I think I'm going to lose my mind. I can't take it anymore. Like, I like to hear, yay, good things are happening. It's a shooting at this street, shooting on this street. It's breaking my heart to see. It's like darkness is all around us all the time. The world is dark. Maybe you're in a phase of your life where your life feels dark. It feels like there's no light. It feels like you're lost. It feels like there's death and destruction around you. It feels like sickness is all around you. It feels like darkness is just coming as a weight over us. And you start to ask the question, where is God in this? And that takes us to verse 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus is the one who has created all things, and he gives us life, and he brings light. And this light is going to win, which is super important for us to understand. Because so many people are losing hope. We're losing hope. We're starting to believe that maybe God has forgotten us almost. It's starting to feel like the world and the culture and everything is crumbling. It's starting to feel like everybody's getting sick. Everybody has an issue. It feels hopeless. And John is saying, listen, this is 2,000 years ago. This guy wrote this a long time ago. They felt that way too. And he's like, listen, the light shines in the darkness and darkness will not win. This is who Jesus really is. Totally different than maybe the Jesus that we think about. Maybe totally different from the traditional aspect of your, even the way you're thinking about your relationship to him. Because these five verses put me at a place of feeling, in a very good way, small. I feel like an infant who needs to be taken care of. I see Jesus as so big, so immense, as the owner of all things. I see him in his rightful place, and I feel like a baby who needs to be cuddled, wrapped in a burrito blanket, nice and tight, and held by my Lord. It made me feel so small to know that I'm not in control, but he is. It made me feel small to know that this darkness is all around me, but he's going to beat it. I need someone to take care of me. I'm not in control. And the most awesome thing is it's Jesus is the one who takes care of me. This Jesus. Not Jesus is my homeboy t-shirt Jesus. Not Jesus, I go to church once in a while so he's not mad at me, Jesus. Jesus, the king and God of the universe, the giver of life, the one who saved us all. This one makes me feel so small. But like a baby... In the, in the arms of a parent, safe. Changes the way you see Jesus when you start to process this. And if I know him as this, I'm going to act and think different because if I know the way, the way, I can live like the way. And so now if I understand who he really is, that he's in control, he's the king, he's the creator, I start to look at myself as a place in his story not living out mine. So now, I've just messed up your whole American Christian religion. I'm really excited about that because I want you to know him, the real him. I want you to fall in love with Jesus of the scriptures, the Jesus 
who is serious about holiness and serious about love, serious about forgiveness, serious about caring for others, serious about taking care of the poor, the broken, the hurting, the lost, serious about this movement that he started of love that was so different, so radical from everyone else that people didn't like him. and He didn't stop. He kept loving those people. That's our Jesus. And now to follow the way, now you know the way. Will you follow this King Jesus? Once again, thank you so much for listening. If you live in Southeast Wisconsin, we'd love to connect with you at our weekend gathering. For service time, directions, and to learn more about our vision to ignite a movement of love that transforms our community and the world, visit us at mosaicwi.com.